Yeah, and we get in a fight in the first period back then, and um, back then you get kicked out of the game with one fight. And uh, but he didn't get the guy good enough in the fight, so he's a little cuckoo, and uh, he um, ended up going to their dress room. So I had to follow him over there, and he wants to fight the whole dress room. The two guys we fought, the four guys that weren't playing. Um, he fought all, all six of them, and then the owner came in, and he punched that guy in the face, too, Mel Liss. <laughs> and then later on that night, we went to the bar because uh, the coach was mad at us, and uh, he fought three uh, football players, Okanagan's son, at the bar. It's funny. Well, that's, what, what, is, what is that at the end of the day, like 10 fights in one day? Yeah, it was crazy. I've never seen those like Bruce Lee. That's crazy, crazy stuff. That was former captain of the Dan Barry Trashers, Dave McIsaac. And you are listening to the Up My Hockey podcast with Jason Padorn. Welcome to Up My Hockey with Jason Padolan, where we deconstruct the NHL journey, discuss what it takes to make it, and have a few laughs along the way. I'm your host, Jason Padolan, a 31st overall draft pick who played 41 NHL games, but thought he was destined for 1,000. Learn from my story and those of my guests. This is a hockey podcast about reaching your potential. Hey there, and welcome back to the Up My Hockey podcast with Jason Padolan. I am Jason Padolan, your host, and today we are speaking with Dave McIsaac. Uh, Dave McIsaac was is what you would call a journeyman professional. Uh, he played on a lot of different teams, had a lot of one-way deals, never had his body in an NHL jersey, unfortunately, uh, but he did play pro in the IHL, AHL level and overseas for many years. He was also the captain of many of those teams uh, and was a championship player. He, uh, he won a, a Division I national championship with the University of Maine, which we cover with uh, the likes of Paul Correa and Jim Montgomery on that team. Uh, he also won a championship in the AHL level with the Philadelphia Phantoms. Uh, he was my captain in Lowell, and he had been somebody that I wanted to interview actually for a while, and we'd reached out and we had talked about it, and anyways, things just never happened, and I, I never necessarily pursued it. And then the other night, uh, we decided to watch a movie. So we looked on Netflix, as I'm sure is the process for a lot of people in this day and age, and I came across the new documentary called Untold Crime and Penalties. Uh, which I hadn't heard of before. Uh, we decided to put it on. Anyways, watch this, uh, watch this documentary on the uh, Danbury Trashers. And at the very end of the program, uh, they're talking about a reunion and bringing back section, uh, the infamous section 102. And it's this bar scene. And I'm like, that's Dave McIsaac. That has to be Dave McIsaac. So I rewind it. I look, I'm like, that's Dave McIsaac. So anyways, look up Dave on the Hockey DB. And sure enough, Dave played for the Danbury Trashers. And not only did he play for them, but he was the captain of that team as well. So he was uh, part of the last team right before they got shut down. Uh, I won't mess the movie up for you, but I reached out to Dave. And I'm like, holy smokes, man. Like, let's get you on the podcast. Let's have a discussion. Your story's worth telling. And now, uh, because it is the hot new thing with the, uh, with the Trashers and the release of the of the documentary that I'm like, who better to have on at this point in time than Dave? So we are going to talk to Dave McIsaac. We talk about his time in Maine. We talk about his time as a pro. We talk about uh, his coaching philosophy. Oh, and by the way, he is also the new head coach of the pro team in Danbury, which is now called the uh, the Hattricks. So uh, pretty cool, his story, how he ended up uh, becoming a Danbury trasher, his experience there. Uh, and now that he's back full circle, now he's coaching the team in Danbury. Uh, Lots of good stuff in this episode. Um, It actually coincides perfectly with uh, my affiliation with Verbero, which you're going to be hearing more about. Verbero is is an apparel company. It's also a hockey equipment company uh, that they go direct to consumer is their style. You don't see them in stores, but you do have a lot of of, uh, of people such as myself that have experienced their equipment and now become, uh, I guess, ambassadors for the program. So 
Uh, Verbero is something that um, you can check out. I'll leave the I'll leave the link in in the disc, in the show notes. Uh, as far as if you want to get up my hockey swag uh, that is sponsored by Verbero with my logo, whether it be a bag or whether it be gloves or or um, or apparel, uh, you can definitely go check that out. But they are also the official. Danbury Trasher jersey sponsor. So if you want an official replica of the Danbury Trashers, uh, the Galante jersey is live and available right now. So make sure you uh, visit Verbero.com to find that out. You can even get it uh, signed by AJ Galante, uh, I believe is a special promo they have going on right now. So um, and Dave, I believe, has his captain jersey on eBay right now, riding the wave. So if you're interested in having the uh, the captain's jersey, the McIsaac jersey um, from the Danbury Trashes last last season, uh, then you can go on eBay and check that out as well. So uh, yeah, Verbero is a great brand. I will be, like I said, I'll be talking more about them. Um, you can get the Galante jersey. I'll, I'll include that in the show notes. And uh, now let's get into the interview with the uh, captain of the Danbury Trashers and now the head coach. Mr. Dave McIsaac. All right, here we are. Um, I think this is episode 71, Mac, or if you can believe that. Wow. Congratulations. Crazy. But uh, welcome to the show. This is so cool. Sitting here with uh, Dave McIsaac. Welcome to the program, man. Thanks for having me, Pots. Appreciate it. No problem, man. Um, so, yeah, a little backstory uh, for those listening. I played with, with Dave, in, um, or we played together in Lowell. Um, and anyways, that's a hell of a long time ago, 99, 2000. Mm-hmm. And had been in touch like a tiny little bit just over social media. And then there I am sitting with my boys the other night um, watching Untold. I, did, I didn't even know that it was really out, just surfing Netflix. Like, oh, let's watch this. And then right at the very end, boom, I'm like, I know that profile. That <laughs> is Mr. McIsaac. So saw you at the end there and then uh, reached out again. And um, anyways, what a great excuse to catch up. I, I know this has probably been crazy for you um, with the movie coming out and everything else. But uh, how you been, boss? Yeah, good. Yeah, like you said, it's been crazy. The the amount of people that reached out in the last uh, three or four weeks was I haven't heard from in a long time. So it's, it's right. Been good. Well, I mean, it's to me, it's wild because, like, I was obviously around the game, in the game, professional hockey player. Like, I had no idea, zero. You know, like, yeah. and I'm sure it must have not have been like a huge secret either, mind you. You know, but like, was it a secret or like how, how was that whole thing? No, it wasn't really. Were you over in you probably over in Germany then? Were you in 2000? Yeah, I was right? gone then. Yeah, I was I was in overseas. Yeah, no, so it wasn't that much of a secret. I know a lot of guys played in that league, like Chelios played in that league during the lockout year, the first year, and I was trying to get guys like Garth Snow. I think you played with him right in the island. Well, no, yeah, he was yeah briefly. Yeah, yeah. Briefly. and um, Eric Weinrich. I was trying to get him to go and. They were close to go, and they just didn't. Right. Trigger. So, I will get into that. We'll get into that. I want to get to Danbury, um, but who? Just as far as like the the media kind of profile now, like is is has it just been old players that have been reaching out, or has there been people that want to want to chat about the whole thing? As far as media is concerned, a little bit of both, um, but mostly old players. A lot of podcasts like you're doing, but yeah, right. a lot of a lot of stuff. Yeah, that's funny. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I you said that you listened to a couple of my a couple of my interviews. Uh, this is more about the story, about the ride, about being a pro. You know, that sometimes I have on guys that are NHL all stars, like you know, Jerome McGinley, Hall of yeah. Famer. Or sometimes I got guys that played pro and 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 you know had a had a great career. And there's different paths and there's different journeys. And and you're one of those guys that had a great pro career, never never were able to get that toe in the in the NHL for a, to get your name on the back of a jersey. But you know, hell, great a, a great career that, that that started in university. So I'd love to go over that a little bit, and then we'll get to Danbury in 05, 06. But I mean, you went a lot of places before that. So, uh, what was life growing up like for you? Like, um, you end up going to U of Maine. What was your road like to get there? I grew up in, in outside of Boston. Just played um, normal hockey A the first year, double A the second year, and um, I went to Maine and wasn't on scholarship, and so I left and played junior for a couple of years um, in Halifax, but 
while I was playing junior in Halifax, I, I told you a story last night about uh, an episode. I went to Kelowna for a couple, about three weeks, I guess, before I w- went back to Halifax the second year. Right. And uh, that was a good story, if you want me to tell that one. Yeah, yeah, no, tell me. Like, so, you know, for those of you not familiar with, with, with Dave, like he was, I mean, I don't know, how would you classify, classify yourself? I mean, I'd say a stay-at-home defenseman. You know, they obviously like to play physical. I think that was part of your – part of your DNA um, you definitely like to be protect your teammates like you took that role real seriously um, it, was that something that you grew into as a pro or did you have that even at that junior level you just knew that that was what it was about yeah no I think I had that all the time but um, I always thought I was a power play guy and uh, and then I just uh, ended up liking the fight a little bit and so it developed from there I guess gotcha when did that transition happen Mac no, I was always uh, like growing up. I was it was a tough town growing up. But it's not so tough anymore. Arlington, Mass is the town I grew up in, um, but it was a tough town. And then I went in junior, and that was tough too. And then even in Maine, I you weren't supposed to fight in college, but um, I'd fight off the ice a little bit sometimes. Right, that part of the upbringing, like you said, yeah. part of the roots. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So tell that story. So we uh, you came out. You were playing with uh, the Spartans in Kelowna. You were telling me uh, what year was that? Do you remember? Um, 1990, 91, 90, 90, 90, no, 91, 92, 91, gotcha. 92. And so I was living with, uh, Sasha Lakovic, um, who I'm sure all of your listeners will. Well, they might not describe Sasha and, uh, <laughs> tell us a little bit about Sasha. He was, uh, even playing pro, he was, um, tough, tough kid. Right. So he, uh, back then he was just one of them guys that, um, you know, was, Never thought he'd play pro, but he ended up playing a lot of games with Calgary. I'm not sure who else he played for. Right. So you guys are playing for Kelowna. Yeah, and we get in a fight in the first period back then, and um, back then you get kicked out of the game with one fight. And uh, But he didn't get the guy good enough in the fight, so he's a little cuckoo, and uh, he um, ended up going to their dress room. So I had to follow him over there, and he wants to fight the whole dress room. The two guys we fought, the four guys that weren't playing, um, he fought all, all six of them, and then the owner came in, and he punched that guy in the face, too, Mel Liss. <laughs> and then later on that night, we went to the bar because uh, the coach was mad at us, and uh, he fought three uh, football players, Okanagan's son, at the bar. It's funny. Well, that's, what, what, is, what is that at the end of the day, like 10 fights in one day? Yeah, it was crazy. I've never seen those, like Bruce Lee. That's crazy. crazy stuff. And so what, crazy. you never, like, he, he, did he even take a punch in that whole thing? Or was he knocking yeah, guys maybe out? Yeah, but. Maybe a few, but it was uh, it was just out of the wild, wild west back then, right? But, right. Uh, sad he passed away, right? So uh, crazy. I didn't even know that. No, but I didn't he, know. Yeah, that. He, he had. I want to say it was like brain cancer or something crazy. Oh my gosh, that's yeah. terrible. It's, yeah, sad news. Were you just there for support during this whole? For, for, yeah, I, the grabbed, I grabbed the guy in the headlock, make sure uh, he didn't uh, jump in or whatever. Right. So for those of you listening, I know I know some some of my listeners are local. So that was at the Civic Arena, like that little soapbox. So you're at the far end there, like how, even getting in there. Like was that with the like with street clothes on? You, you walked around after after taking your own stuff up. Yeah, well, I, I guess do we have to wear suits back then. I'm not sure. Um, Probably. But, yeah, um, maybe with suits on. I guess. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's so crazy. So you and so you went to Maine first, then you go play junior, then you go back to Maine, like and then you back got recruited Maine. on scholarship, or how did that work? Yeah, yeah. So I, I had a good junior career. I was um, I was runner up for uh, player of the whatever of Canada next to Korea. Really? Junior, yeah. And uh, so then I went back to Maine on scholarship, and ended up playing with Korea. Yeah, I was going to say because I looked, I was looking at the thing there because I, I played with um, I played with Paul in Penticton. Oh, did you? okay. Yeah. yeah. So I was I was wondering if we crossed paths that year. Or not. Yeah, that was probably the same year. Yeah. Right. Because, um, geez, I don't have my own hockey DB up, but I think that I was 15. I was more than 76. I would have been 91. Yeah. I would have been 91, yeah. I think, is when I would have been the 91, 92, probably. So we went to the Centennial Cup that year, and uh, both years I was in Halifax, we went to the Centennial Cup, but um, – that's when they awarded Korea with the player of the, the year or whatever, right? He was there. Okay. I don't think you guys made it, but right. he was there. And, uh, yeah, well, he had, like, whatever he had. I don't even know, right. like 160 points in 40 games or something as a 17-year-old, right. which was right. crazy. Um, so then you guys – so what was that like? So when you get to University of Maine, you're both you're both up for this award. 
um, I would classify you guys as different types of players. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, what was your experience like with him there? Because he only had the one year there, right? I, I believe he, he had the first year, year in Obi Baker. Year and a little bit went. before the Olympics started. He played the second year a little bit, but not not a lot. Right. Um, I led the country in points for a defenseman that year. All right, I love telling this story. Um, I'd set up behind my own net on the power play, and Korea would swing in and pick up the puck and go end to end and be the passer or scorer, and I'd get the assist every time. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yeah, so that's 92, 93. So Paul Career, for those listening, he had 100 points as a 17-year-old in D1 hockey in 39 games. And he was what, like 165 pounds? Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah just and missed, tiny... missed some games too with the uh, World Juniors. Right. So, yeah, because that full schedule was 45 there, looks like. So he right. missed six games, had 100 points, uh, won the Hobie Baker. And there's Dave McIsaac. He had 37 points in 35 games. 32 assists, and they were all probably just first assist to Paul there on the power play. Hey? Or second assist and pass it, and I'll get the second. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I had a chance to play with him, um, and I've talked with, uh, like, Todd Warner had a chance to play with him that Olympic year. We talk, I talked with him about a bit. I mean, here's a guy, and he gracefully declined, by the way. I got in touch with him, and, like, he's just not a – you know how he was, right. right? Like, he's just not a media guy, and he's, he's like – He's a surfer he's, now. I, think he I said no to everybody. I just – you know, I, I, I'm not going to do it right now. So I'd love to have him on the show at some point. But um, he was just, like – I mean, he was obviously massively gifted. I mean, that massively talented. But he was wired different, too. Like, you know, his his approach to practice, in my mind, was different, like, ahead of his time. Like, his approach to the mental game was ahead of his time. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, yeah, what do you – like, what do you see there? Because you saw him even, I mean, a little older age bracket than me. He'd already been drafted at that point. Like, he might have even gotten more into that vein. But, like, what do yeah. you remember from him in that? We had, we had an assistant coach at Maine, um, Grant Stanbrook, um, who still helps guys in the NHL a lot still. Um, I know he helped Jimmy Montgomery when he was in Dallas. But – um. He uh, he brought that mind that like stuff that wasn't happening back then, that visualization and stuff like that to um, to the locker room. And Korea went a step above that, right? So he'd you know do the juggling stuff and he'd switch hands on the stick and shoot as a lefty sometimes, just uh, righty sometimes, and just um, stuff that was unheard of back then, right? Right. Yeah, Todd told a story. Um... For those, it was a really good interview, actually. Taught like he he said that like Paul's visualization, um, and again, I mean now like the mental game goes obviously as you know way beyond visualization, but that was like a high performance tool that was just sort of being recognized, right? And how are you going right. to use it, and, and to what capacity? And I think all of us, you know, as we would go to bed at night or maybe for our nap, like we would we would see ourselves scoring goals or whatever, and you know we didn't even really know we were visualizing, but he would actually use it as a as a tool. And, and I guess he, it, it was so descriptive. Like he'd want to know who the referees were, right. what, you know, what, what, uh, how many fans were in the building, right? Like what, what color the jerseys were. Cause I guess like everything yeah. about what he was doing was just dialed, you know, yeah. was just dialed. Um, and then even beyond that, I mean, I think like from a social standpoint, and that's one thing, Mac, that I've, you know, I, I've started to more analyze kind of in later years, not, ne right. not necessarily when I was playing, but just like, what does success look like? I mean, like success though, at like the kind of levels like that Korea kind of steps right. into, you know, these guys that you hear stories about. And, um, and Paul was like, I, I wouldn't call him one of the boys. You know what I mean? Like he, he wasn't one of the boys because he had a different standard or right, like a right. different expectation about himself. Would you, would you agree with that? Yeah, a little bit. I think he tried to fit in as much as he could, but yeah, I, I, I know what you're saying. He was, he was above everyone else. So it was tough to, Tough to fit in like that, I guess. Well, right. And he just like, and I mean, like, you know, I don't know. We were in Penticton together, but I mean, there were some parties in Penticton. Like he was rarely at them. Right. You know, like it just wasn't, I, I just think that his idea of where he wanted to go and who he wanted to be, I think was kind of, it was, it was just a more mature, right. more evolved spot, I think, than, than the I rest know, of us. You look back and I wish I had that in me, right? So <laughs> right, <laughs> crazy stuff. But I do think, um, and that's one of the things. Like when I'm working with players now too, I'm, I'm I'm working with them on on the off ice side of things, and you know, obviously using the stuff that one. Like I mean, I'm sure you had some stuff that worked well for you that you want to pass on. Obviously, stuff that we wish we would have known or would have done a little differently, right? And right. and that whole idea of like a personal standard and like evolving that personal standard about you know where it is you want to go and does it align with where you want to get to. Um, 
I mean, I don't know. I wasn't thinking like that. You I mean, I was just a good hockey player that, I mean, I thought I worked hard in the ice and I had some fun with the boys. And that was about, I mean, that was really about the, the, the context of, right. of where, where it was for me. Whereas I think guys like, I mean, these hall of fame type guys, I think that they're thinking about the game quite a bit different than probably. No, yeah, than I, I, I agree. But, I, but I, I mean, it depends where you want to go with it. Right. So if you want to be one of them guys and, and you commit to the discipline it takes to do that, then, right. then that's one thing, but sometimes I don't know. I'm not going to regret anything that I did because I didn't get there. Right. Yeah. No, fair enough. You I mean, and I hear you too. Like regrets a weird word, you know, like I, I think in the moment we're doing the best that we can with the tools that we got, you know, um, sure. would I like to play more games in 41, the NHL? Yeah. You I mean, could there have been some things I could have done differently? Sure. Right. Um, but I've said that before too. If I would have done all those things, right. I probably wouldn't be sitting here talking with you right now. And I really enjoy this conversation. <laughs> 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 you know what I mean? like, life is what it is and i think it's just for me it's like just opening that perspective and those eyes for the younger athletes of like this is possible like whether mm -hmm. this is for you i mean that's your choice right but like there is there is an avenue out there there is a door to open that you can pursue in a way that's a bit more professional than maybe you are right now you know in a way in a way that's a bit more dedicated and committed that's going to get you to be a better player and it's probably going to get you closer more closely aligned with what the hell it is you want to where you want to play and what you want right, to become, right? For sure. um, as a coach now because i know you are a coach of dan and you've coached a little bit in the past like is, is how do you how do you handle today's player or how do you envision handling today's player like with stuff like that with about the on ice stuff but i think it's becoming more about the, coaching the person as much as you're coaching the hockey player these days yeah, I don't think um, players nowadays party like we used to party back then, right? So you hear the NHL guys, all the the players in the NHL, they don't they don't go to the bar, they just play video games or whatever they do in their hotel room, right? And that didn't happen back then. So um, I mean, you still you know you learn every year what what differences and things you can change and stuff, but right? Yeah, I mean, how is that? Like, I mean, is is that is that do you do you see that as being a challenge like I mean we in our day and age there was a culture around teams and there were there was I mean culture is kind of a buzzword now when it comes to the coaching community and like what what your culture is uh I know you played on teams where there was a culture of success right where you would win right. games and there is there is some underlying feeling that allowed that to happen and there's other places where we went to and it was kind of a selfish environment or what have you right um the teams that I played best on or the teams that we had the most success with were when looking back on it now, we're the family oriented teams. And by family, I mean the teams that we did stuff together all the time, right, right. you know, like we had each other's back off the ice, on the yeah. ice. We, we, we partied together, you know, we, we, we did everything together. Right. And, and the teams that were more individual, I found were fragmented on the ice too. And we didn't really get her done. And to your point, it sounds like, like on the road, I hear guys order room service, like you said, and they, they're playing video games, you know, and, right, and right. they're doing whatever, like, how do you overcome that challenge of maybe, what you know as a player and what I know right. as with you as a player, which was successful, which guys aren't doing now. How do you incorporate a winning culture on a, on a team these days? Yeah. Well, I think there's different, you know, different areas to, to bring teams together more than, than just going to the bar or whatever you do hang out together. I mean, there's, I don't know, like in Danbury now our owners own like a, a paintball studio. So we'll go there one day this year. We'll, you know, just try to do different things that, that bring the team together and, yeah, I mean, there's millions of different things you can do. Sure, uh, I think there has to be an intention to it, though, right? Like it doesn't just happen on its own. I think that's part of oh, for sure. part of building that culture, right? Is creating those environments and those spaces, and um, yeah, and if it's not obviously, you don't have to go out to the bar and have six beers to to get together and and you know and, and to and to bond. But um, but I do think togetherness is an essential part of it. Yeah, you know I mean, right. and I and I think that today's generation is so buried on their phone or whatever it is that they're doing that it it, it seems to me a little more individual based you know um which i had imagined being a challenge at the pro level but uh so that year did you guys win did you guys go all the way and, and win the national championship that year yeah that may now yeah, we did yeah you did best, hey? college, best college team ever they say really yeah that's awesome what was uh was were you guys challenged at all like what was the final like we um our, we went 42 one and two our team the team we lost to was bu we lost in overtime and then beat him the next night six zero, and then uh, and we played Lake State. We were down, I think three two um, after the second period, or four two maybe. And um, Jim Montgomery scored a hat trick in the uh, in the third period, all from Korea. 
Right. Do they play together all year? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. That's a special. Is that, is that like your, I mean, you played a lot of hockey. Is, is that, is that the most memorable season of your, of your career? Yeah, that's one of them. I won a championship in, in Philly too. So that was fun. Um, yeah. I mean, every time you're on a winning team, you always remember those, those things. Right. So. Right. Um, so let's talk about pro. So, I mean, you, so you win the national championship, Korea leaves. Like, were you guys nearly as good the next year? I mean, I didn't, I didn't follow that. Did you guys get to the frozen four again? No, the following year after that, we did again. We went to the final and lost, but it was, you know, it's not the same, you know, it's not the same team. It's just, um, it's, um, less, less talented guys fighting right. together. So I was proud of that team too, but, um, when you're talking about that, the first team that we won it with was just an unbelievable special. I mean, hockey everyone team. on the team went pro somewhere. Right. Yeah. That's crazy. So, yeah. So you, you leave Maine. What was, what was that like? Did you, did you ever, did you sign a free agent contract there with, um, with somebody or how did that I, work? Um, I left Maine right after the season, my senior year and um, went to Milwaukee for the play like a couple of games in the playoffs in the IHL. Yeah. And the following season, I signed with Milwaukee again for a year played the whole year there and then i signed with philly the year after that for three years i was with philly is that an nhl deal or an ahl deal yeah all nhl deals but all one-year deals and i'd have to resign and resign and resign gotcha so it was uh even when i you know i went to lowell on one-year deal and then i went to um san jose on a one-year deal and then i went to florida on a one-year deal and got traded to hartford or the rangers right how was that first deal? Was there anyone was was there a decision to be made, or did you just take the 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 offer that was there and, and ran with it? Yeah, it was it was uh, the Phantoms' first year in the league, and they were building the team there, and it looked good that the Phantoms and the Flyers were playing in the same rink or same city, right? So you'd think you'd get called up more, but it didn't work out that way. <laughs> you guys had some good teams there, though. Were you playing with Peter White? Is that the Peter White era? Yeah, yeah, Peter White. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was a really yeah. good minor, minor leaguer. Yeah, Prosper was there then too, probably. I think at that yeah, time. Yeah, Benny Prosper was the first first year we were there. He, um, yeah, we had some real good teams. We should have won the first year. We had a better team, but uh, lost to Hershey in seven games. That was by a Lois era too, right? Yeah, Frankie was there too. Frankie the animal. Did you play with him up at St. John's? No, no, he wasn't there when I was there. I played against him though. Um, you guys had some tough teams in Philly. I remember that. I remember that being a being a tough barn to play in. You guys had mm -hmm. some. Well, we had a tough team in, in Toronto. I mean, in St. John's too. Like that team, that yeah. team was no joke. I remember we had some good battles there with with uh, with the Phantoms. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> did you ever fight Bird Dog? Rest in peace. No, I never did. No, never did. Oh, but I know, I know Bird Dog. Yeah. God, we could we could we could spend all day telling stories of Bird Dog stories. All my friends up in Newfoundland, they, that's they they all still talk about him all the time. Yeah. What's his name? He's running for uh, mayor or something now. Terry Ryan. Yeah, Tr. Terry Ryan. <laughs> He's uh, count. Counselor, Congress yeah, counselor, counselor or something, yeah. I think. I think he's running for. Um, he do a good job. I hope he gets in. I don't know if yeah, he is or not, or not. however it goes, but he's smart enough. Um, mm -hmm. have some have some new ideas, I think. Yeah, for sure. I'm not into politics very much myself, but I think he'd do a good job. What yeah. was it? Was it the election yesterday in Canada or something? Yeah. And Trudeau's still in or that's a great question. It tells it shows you how much <laughs> I am I, I follow it. I, I should I should looked it up. Actually, it was on my list of things to do this morning to read the paper. And see. <laughs> but I don't know. I, I think I did look last night, and he was projected to win um, when I looked. I guess it looked like he was projected to win. So um, more of the same, I guess, around here. What um, what was that experience like in Philly? Uh, did you – I mean, three, you ended up playing three years there, and you had some really good teams. Like you said, won a championship. Uh, what 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 was what was some of the mem memorable yeah, moments? Yeah, well, Johnny that? Stevens okay. was our captain, and um... – you know, he's, he's the one that, you know, showed me how to be a captain, I guess, right? So that was um, – he was a great leader. And we had Billy Barber as our coach who was a great motivator. And uh, we had some, a lot of talent, so it was a lot of fun. Gotcha. Thank you for tuning in today. Just take a short break from the interview with Dave. To give a shout out to Verbero. Uh, Verbero is a company that I spoke about in the intro. You can find them on my website, upmyhockey.com, uh, and under gear. So if you want to get Up My Hockey gear, uh, that is where to do it. Uh, they, they make a great product. You get the Up My Hockey branding. Uh, you can grab a hat, you can grab a bag, t shirts, uh, you know, you name it, hockey jersey. 
uh, practice jersey. You can you can name it. Great for Christmas. Great for birthdays. Uh, so you can check out the product there. They also make fantastic equipment. Like I use their stick. It's a blackout version. It's the lightest stick on the market. Uh, it's the best stick I've ever used, uh, plain and simple. The gloves uh, that I use from them, Verbero gloves, are also the best I ever used. Right out of the box, like fantastic. Uh, and that's at verbero.com. Uh, you can get uh, a discount, a 5% discount, or maybe even 10% discount if you uh, use Up My Hockey uh, at, uh, at checkout. Uh, so you can get that through me uh, using the Up My Hockey discount code. Uh, really highly recommend you give this stuff a try. Uh, it gets shipped to your house right away. You won't find it in sports stores, and it's uh, and it really is a quality product. Uh, also, if it is something that you would like to get your team outfitted with uh, custom custom gear, uh, custom gloves, uh, that type of thing, uh, Verbero can do that for you. Uh, you can DM me if you're interested in checking out what that looks like. Um, Andy Sutton, who's a former guest uh, of the Up My Hockey podcast, is the president of that uh, of the company now. He bought it and has done some great things with uh, with the brand. So, uh, in saying that, obviously they they were able to they were able to partner with uh, with Galante and and the uh, and the Danbury Trashers, and and that's where you can get the uh, the official replica jersey right now, which has been a hot hot item for for Verbero, and they're really promoting that well. So that you get that on the on the Verbero website right now with the uh, the Danbury Trasher jersey. Uh, so, anyways, we'll get back to the episode. Uh, but again, put that in the back of your heads. Uh, Verbero, a great great product. Great, uh, great equipment, great apparel, and you also can get your Up My Hockey gear uh, at upmyhockey.com under gear through Vibero. Thank you. I love digging into that, so I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to ask you, you know, uh, coming out of coming out of university, you know, unlike the guys coming out of the Western League or junior, you know, like you guys are older, right? You're older, um, but you're still rookies when you come out. So it's kind of an interesting scenario, right? I, I remember talking about that with Jason Blake was, was on here one time and that was after a year in Lowell, right? Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I was, I was in LA and you know, he was, he was this rookie, this shiny new penny yet he was older than me. You know right, I mean? right. And, and I was like washed up, you know, it was like, it, it was, it's kind of an interesting scenario, but, but you guys are coming out, you're stepping into pro. I mean, obviously D one is, is great hockey, but it's still not pro hockey. Right. So you're trying to figure out what pro hockey is, um, figure out your way. And then, it's nice to have somebody, right? It's nice to have somebody that, you know, will show you the way right. or that kind of oh, takes sure. you under their wing. What, um, what did he do for you or what were, what were those things that, uh, that helped you get, get I around? just think, um, you know, his, his commitment to, to being the leader. And, and, and I think they brought him in there just for that really. And he great player too, tough guy, everything. Um, but that whole organization, the culture there was a little different than other American league teams that we played for. Even Lowell, we didn't, have really a, a workout. I mean, you could go to the gym and work out if you wanted to, but there was no strength coach or one of them, but we had that in Philly. And I think um, that helped a lot, right? So. Right. So he was just, a, I mean, did he, was he a leader by like an example kind of guy? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. We were telling a story the other day that um, he used to get pissed off, like someone would hit Johnny, but everyone would jump on the guy, right? And just beat him up or whatever, right? And uh, Johnny would get so pissed off, I can take care of myself. You know, one of them. How guys. old was he at the time? He'd probably be about thirty then, I guess. Gotcha. Oh, I see. You played with Mizey too, there. Yeah, Mizey was there. He was there. Uh, I think he got kicked out by the end of it, but uh, right. Chris Joseph yeah. was there too. Yeah, yeah. Neil Little Litz was there. Yeah, Litz was our uh, backstop. Yeah. Oh my gosh, he's a great dude. Met him a few times. He came up. He was best friends with Osgood, so he'd come up to this oh, tournament right. all the time here. And oh, he'd, oh my gosh, what a, I mean, it's impossible not to laugh when you're around that guy. Oh, he's not. He's still here in town. So, is he? he um, I don't know what he's, he was scouting for Florida. Now I think he, uh, they've got new management there, so I think they let him go. Gotcha. You have to say hi to him for me. That's for good. sure. For sure. Delhi too. Delhi, yeah. Delhi was a rookie that year we won, or the maybe the yeah I think the year we won. He was a rookie. Was that the year he got called up and ended up getting a hat trick in one of those games? Yeah, yeah, I think so. No, the, that was like the following year, but yeah, he. Uh, Holy smokes, that's crazy! I just brought up the DB. I love seeing all his names. Jamie Hewer to play with him in St. John's. That's uh, wow! What a what a crew. Colin Forbes, Frank the Animal, two hundred fifty nine Pims. Jeff Lank, he's a Vernon boy. Oh, is Jeff he? Lank. Whatever uh -huh. happened to Jeff Lank? You know. He's still around. He um he's a liberal. Um, so if you're not into politics, don't follow him. He, <laughs> no, he comments on all the uh 
on all the um american politics down here on all my friends pages so um, oh does he it's funny i just follow him just for that that's great that's great i'll have to go check him out that's wild so what you mentioned um barber being a motivator how what 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 makes you define him as that well i don't think he was like an x's and o's coach right some guys are, are that but um he'd come in and throw about 25 f-bombs between periods and you know that we knew we better start playing better <laughs> so in that way he was a motivator right and that was his way yeah that was yeah but we understood yeah. it so it was it was good we all you know we, everyone was old enough then to understand what it takes i think to win gotcha how would you define yourself as a coach um um i think i liked it i think maine was a big um influence on my coaching uh sean walsh at maine um and i i still use that stuff today that um that he did back then that was just about motivation uh, not motivation um about um momentum in a game and stuff like that so right yeah that's cool um i've had a few coaches on i think as you know i mean bruce bruce boudreau was one of them which you said you listened to that who was our coach there in lowell and um jared bedner you know coach of the avalanche and and uh brad larson now head coach of the columbus blue Jackets. so i mean i've definitely had had some some really you know reputable big names on, on the show and and it, we usually talk or at some point we talk about like how like back when we played like there was a essentially a one way to do things like that was just sort of the style of the coaching right that the, the coach right. had a personality and you were you were as a player as a team all drenched with that personality there was kind right. of like a one way you know and it, and it seems like from the conversations that i'm having that um the more one way you are these days the let long like the shorter lifespan you have you know, like you have to get, be a little better at understanding the personality in front of you and what's going to motivate them. Do, do you agree with that statement? Yeah, oh, for sure. I think. Yeah. But then you have to have good players too, or you're not going to last long either. Right. So. Yeah. The, my, my favorite one was, uh, was Sutter at this coach's conference. I was at somebody asked him, what's the, what's the, uh, uh, I mean, how do you become a great coach? And, uh, <laughs> And he, he listed off all the teams that he was on. Like he said, I when I was in Calgary, I had Mika Kiprasov. When I was in uh, LA, I had Jonathan Quick. When I was, you know, whatever he goes, if you want to oh, be a good always. coach, find yourself a good goalie. That's first. Yeah. That's first first order of business. Yeah, <laughs> it was pretty humble. It was great. I like the line that there's two types of coaches: coaches with good players and ex coaches. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. True enough. Right. What um. Do you, as far as building your staff or whatever, do you, do you believe that you are the one as the head coach that needs to establish like rapport and, you know, and, and I get to really understand these, these players as people, or do you think it's more of a, you know, you're doing it together, like with the assistant coaches or like, how do you position yourself in that whole mix? Yeah. Well, uh, most of the time when I was coaching, it was minor league. So um, like single A hockey where we don't have assistant coaches or, Gotcha. You know, so I was the guy and I had to do, I was in sales, I was in marketing, I was in, you know, doing all that stuff. Um, but now this year, I think I'm going to have some coaches and you'll have to delegate, you know, different things to them. But obviously you have to take charge and understand the dynamic of the team, I guess. Right. Yeah. Because I just remember looking back, like it was in our era, the head coach was usually like, kind of unapproachable you know in a lot of i mean i don't know if that's the right word but i mean yeah yeah right, he wasn't yeah. too accessible and then the assistant coaches were kind of like the go-betweens right they were yeah. your buddies they're the ones playing cards at the back of the bus and right. you know like they'd be the one that would talk to you about whatever and um i don't know if that's still the same or not um i, I it seems like uh the coaches now are more it seems uh, like there's more coaches now it's like this the nhl teams at least have like have a a mindset coach, uh, a strength coach, uh, assistant coach for this, that, this. Yeah, power play, power yeah, play power guy, play penalty play, kill yeah. guy, yeah. skill guy. Like you said, you know, psychologist. You know, there's yeah, no, there's there's somebody for everyone. It seems like now, right. um, and the game is so technical that I, it almost seems like the head coach. I mean, isn't really involved in the X's and O's as much. You know, like there, there's right. less and less of that. I think it's. I think it is managing people now, right? And being a, and right. figuring out how to get the most out of your players, whatever that means. Um, when you were playing, did you ever see yourself behind the bench? Um, I thought, you know, I, I thought, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, it was always something I wanted to do. So I uh, took a, I was, I coached about five years pro 
And then I took the last seven years I was doing something else because I, I got fired in Iceland. I was coaching in Iceland. I got fired from that job. I said, it's not stable enough for me to do this anymore. And uh, then I took a job with the Flyers running their, their practice, one of their rinks for the last six years or so. Sweet. So who did you guys beat in the final there with Philly? Um, St. John's Flames. Right. Yeah. With uh, who was on that team? Um, Marty St. Louis was on that team and Chick okay. was a goalie. And... Yeah. Um, I love his story. That's so awesome, that story. Flames told me never play in the NHL again. <laughs> <laughs> Hall of Famer. I mean, that's just so crazy. Like, yeah. I mean, that story in of itself, like every hockey, young hockey player should know that. And not saying that everyone can be Martin St. Louis, but like, you know what I mean? Like, right. it, it's this close. I mean, he could have packed it up and just mm -hmm. said, uh, whatever, you know, yeah. like, not for me, I guess. And then he's a Hall of Fame guy with Stanley Cups and Art Ross trophies and I mean, yeah, like, crazy. that's just nuts. And that wasn't early in his career either. That was like, all, like, he was already 24, 25 years old. Right. Yeah. That's so crazy. What a player he was, man. Mm -hmm. Love that. Love that story about him. So after that win, so we've talked about that too. Like, um, coaches, a lot of times, they'll win a championship in the minors. And that's one of the things that allows them to get that shot um, right. to be an NHL coach. Players are the exact same thing. Usually, usually teams that win, mm -hmm. player, uh, teams want winners. Uh, they get better contracts. They get more opportunities. What was that like for you that year after the after the championship? Was there a few more people calling, or what? What did that look like? No, I signed with Philly another year after that. But um, after that, I went to Lowell with you, and you know, I got a pretty good deal with the Kings. I thought, and I thought I might have a chance, and just didn't end up that way. Gotcha. Were you ever was was there ever a, a time that you thought it was closest, like maybe out of training camp or something, where you thought that there was maybe like there was an opportunity, or do you ever did you ever feel like there was an opportunity? Yeah, no, in San Jose, I definitely did. I got called up for the last. Uh, couple weeks of the season that I didn't play any games they went down to 5d and I was up there and I still didn't play and um but yeah it was it was, it was close a couple of times it just didn't, didn't happen right. oh that's crap that'd have been nice just to get in one hey right, been yeah, cool. for sure. yeah um Kentucky heart well, let's talk about Russia so you you like you said you bounced around on one-year deals like how was that for you I mean I we obviously played together I mean it was pretty tough to rattle you on or off the ice I think you're a pretty even keel guy with a pretty low heartbeat um was was there any anxiety about that with the one-year deals and not really knowing you're going to be and not really having a home kind of for most of your pro career or is that okay for you not um not until the last year I uh you know I ended up I was making pretty good money in the American League and then the last year in Hershey and Hartford, um, I didn't make as good of money. And that's coming off a year in Kentucky where I led the American League in plus minus. And, um, you know, I thought I had a good year. I thought I'd get a good contract and it didn't happen. So right. a little anxious that year. Yeah, just from uh, like putting like what's this going to look like kind of deal, hey? Like right. not even from a hockey standpoint. Yeah, it's tough to start paying your own bills and like, you know, how right. that all works. And did you have a family at the time there? Yeah, yeah, I had a family then, and uh, yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure why I didn't get a deal that next year. I think people thought by then I was a defensive defenseman and I shouldn't be, you know, on the power play or creating offense or I don't know what they thought. But right, yeah. right, yeah. Who knows what people think? That was a year. I've said that on this on this podcast before too. The one year, uh, like when I got traded to LA, so like the year. Well, I guess it would have been two years before I played with you. When I first got traded to LA, I was at the end of my entry level deal, right? Mm -hmm. So I was, and there was a, I had a games, games played clause. If I played 40 games on my entry level deal, um, I would go to a one way contract. So LA didn't call me up until, like, so I, so I got traded. I went to Long Beach, right? So I went to the IHL. They kept me there for five games, then called me up. So then I would end the season at 39 games uh -huh. uh, in, my, in my, right? So that was the first kind of manipulation of like, well, whatever, it's business, right? They do right. that stuff. At the time, I wasn't honestly even aware of it, right? I didn't, right. I mean, I wasn't really conscious of it until after the season was over. But the part that rattled my chain the most was I'd led the AHL in goals that year, right? At 22 years old. Right. I mean, that's not easy to do. And they gave, and I took a pay cut the next year. Yeah, that's... You know what I mean? Like, it's yeah. just like, I mean, like to your point, right? You led the, you led the league in plus minus. You think you're sitting pretty. Like, I didn't think like, I don't know, naive, I guess, right. To the process. But like, yeah. I had no leverage because right. I mean, the situation you're in, you were UF or RFA or whatever the hell I was. 
Um, all they had to do was qualify my my NHL. They had to qualify that. It was a 10% raise. And they didn't have to do anything in the minors. So they like they cut my minor league thing in half. And I'm like, you want me to pay for half as much after leading the AHL in goals? Like, this yeah. is really what you want me to do? Um, anyways, I mean, it is what it is. And that's hockey. But I don't know if it actually is hockey. Because I think in some scenarios, it wouldn't be like that. I think that they would recognize it. And especially in this day and age, right? Like, yeah. hey, great job. It seems right? like they, they screw the minor league guys more than the NHL guys. Yeah. Right? Yeah, the guys that need it, right? right. <laughs> I know, it's so wild. Um, so after Hartford, you leave and you go to Russia. I want to talk about Russia because I've heard some crazy stories about Russia. Did you, like, what, what was that experience like playing over there? I, I liked it. It was um, it was different. Um, it was crazy. It was, you know, mob-related. I'm sure all the whole stories you heard were true. Um and what was your I experience with that? What does that mean, mob related? Because you maybe you you have, you have that other touch with it with Danbury, which we'll get to. Like, what yeah, is, yeah. like what was your first experience like there with Russia and and being mob related? Um, just you know, PE has stories that people don't get paid, or like I remember one time we're in the bar and uh, the goalie, our backup goalie, had a bad game, and the mob was you know you know who the mob was in town, and they all liked me, so it was fine. But this guy, um. They said they were going to string him up by his feet and um, beat him to death if he ever played like that again. So it was uh, crazy stuff. I was telling a story in one of the other podcasts. I there was two mobs in the town that I was in, and um, I was at the bar one night, and uh, with this girl, this guy comes in with a gun. He you know he says, "What do you do? What are your hobbies?" He says to me, "I was like, I don't know. I like to golf." He, I said, "What are your hobbies?" And he pulls out a gun and starts playing with a revolver. And um, so, you know, now I'm scared shitless. And we, we leave right away and we go to this other place. And as I'm walking out of the other place, he's lying dead on the ground with a bullet in his head. So I yeah, think just one that liked me found out about this guy. And I think that's what happened. I'm, I didn't even ask. I just kept walking. Crazy oh stuff. Man. Crazy stories. Yeah, I mean, I heard guys getting paid in envelopes, and I'm sure that's, I mean, just half of it, right? And sometimes, yeah, if you're on a losing streak, you're not getting paid, and things are yeah. good. And, all and of the sudden, games were thrown, like, the you know, with dudes on purpose sometimes. There's just crazy stuff that happens. I think it still happens, but. Oh, yeah? Yeah. What what would be a scenario where you'd lose on purpose? Why would that happen? Uh, the other team needed the points for a, you know, to move up in the division or something, and they the captains will work it out before the game, and, and you know, the, the team would pay us like crazy money just to lose, right? Oh, oh so it was actually financial gain. So yeah, then, financial and, and that would get relayed by the captain to you guys? Like, hey, we got to tank this one? Or it whatever. never really got relayed to me, but we found out like through other people that that's what happened. And, right. and you wondered why, you know, why the captain didn't want to play in overtime or something. Uh, just weird stuff. That <laughs> right. Oh, my goodness. What was life like there? Like life, like not hockey, but like what was it like living there? It was hard. Like our where I was, I was in Eastern Russia. Um, so our closest road game was a ten hour flight. Imagine that. <laughs> a ten Crazy. hour flight? It was a ten hour flight to get to Moscow. So it would fly to Moscow and then branch out from there. Great, like it was a lot of travel. Um, so so your road trips were like you probably like I mean uh, it's not like St. John's but like when we had to leave the Rock like we were gone for two three weeks because we had to play no, everybody else right no it was only two two days so you go away for two days and you come play home for two two games away for two games home so it was a lot of crazy travel wow crazy. that's expensive too yeah yeah it's crazy did uh, what was the hockey like it was awesome it was um, really good hockey Ovechkin was still in the league then. Um, it was his draft year. I think he was on the third line for Dynamo. So he wasn't even, you know, right. He was first overall. Like he would have been first overall the year before that I played. Right. For the NHL draft. And he, uh, so with those, those teams, like, is it like way better than, than, than the AHL or a little bit or not? Or I'd say it was, it was different. It wasn't the same philosophy. Like there's no, wasn't a lot of checking, not a lot of fighting back then, although there was a little bit, but, um, and I think that, you know, ramped up a little bit since then. Right. But, um, you know, it was more angles and stuff like that. And Is it big ice over skilled. there? Uh, yeah, some of the ranks had bigger ice, but it was more skilled. than like, I remember, uh, like, we'd get the red line and dump it in. The coach would go nuts. <laughs> Don't dump it in. Possession, yeah. possession, right? So it was uh, 
crazy stuff. Yeah, different, different game. Right? Different, but yeah. Yeah. Um, came back. Was, it, was there no job there? Did you not want to stay, or did you? No, I think that we didn't do so well that year, and I think they wanted to move on from Americans, and I think they went to Czech players the next year okay. instead of Americans. Right. Um, what was Italy like? You went to the East Coast and then to Italy. Why was that? Uh, Italy was fun too. It was different fun. It was, um, I played with, um, um, just a team in the, it was in the Alps and the Italian Alps. And so I went skiing after the games and it was fun. It was, the food was awesome. Right. It was just yeah. a little quiet town. So it wasn't like, I'm used to, you know, big cities where you can go to party and whatever. Right. And, Right. And this is just a little quiet town in the Alps. So, but I had fun there. I made a lot of friends, and I went back there a couple of years ago again to visit. And it's fun. That's cool. Yeah. When I uh, when I first re- uh, I guess the right words retired. I mean, I was done in Germany, and I was like, okay, I'm going to go back to school, um, go back to university. I thought that was like what my what my calling was, and so I enroll in university, and I'm kind of done. I had my concussion, and I was I was only 30, right? But I was like, ah, I think that's it. And the damn phone doesn't stop ringing, right? You know, like when you're not looking right, for a right, job, right. it's hilarious. And, and like uh, like Milan called me from Italy, and uh, there's another team in Italy, I think maybe Turin, if that's right, um, maybe did, and uh, a couple other teams in like these different areas where I didn't even really know that there was hockey, to be honest. But like yeah. it certainly, certainly sounded cool, right? Like, oh, go to Milan and play, play in yeah. Italy for a year? Like, but the money wasn't awesome. I ended up staying. But I, that was the year I ended up going to Japan. Um, and kind of the same scenario. I ended up going to Japan for the last half of the year because the money was good, and I just was like really too intriguing for me not to yeah. say. Yes I was to I was trying. I was hoping to do that too, just to go to you know Eastern like China or Japan or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was wild. It was yeah, you like cool. that. That was fun. Um, and so now, say so, so Italy. We're gonna check Italy off the list, and I, I mean, we got to talk about trashers because this is like now, now because I do live under a rock. It's like all the rage right now because of the show that came out and. Um, you know, Verbero, this this hockey company that I that I'm affiliated with too, is like oh, now yeah. releasing the the yeah, Trashers jersey, and there's a big release on that. And so, um, let's talk a little Trashers. How, how how did you end up there? And uh, was it AJ that recruited you, or what happened? I was at T Bone. Uh, Tommy Pompasello was um, the the so, trainer. Yeah, the trainer. So is he, he as nuts as he comes across in that movie. Yeah, yeah, he still is nuts. Um, yeah, so I was reti- I retired too that year, and um, it was a lockout year, so there wasn't a lot of jobs. So I said, ah. So I took a job with the Flyers and the, the skate zone there. And uh, Frankie, the animal, was living near me here, and uh, he used to go up there for uh, games, and the guy would pay him like a couple thousand dollars a game to go up there and play. So I'm like, uh, yeah, I want to do that too. you know. So he brought me a couple times, and uh, I ended up, getting divorced that year. And then I um, went up there full time the, fo- the following year. Gotcha. So it was, uh, who did you need to impress? Was it AJ they had to impress the coach or like, how did that whole system work there? Yeah. AJ was in high school. So it wasn't like him. It was, you know, the, his father mostly. So it was, you know, who the coach was that year. The first year was um, Todd Sterling, Steve Sterling's son. Really? Yeah. 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 That's crazy. I, think got, I think he got in trouble too with uh, that whole. I think he got in trouble too. Oh really? Yeah. So you get brought in by Frank the Animal um, by Lois, yeah. uh, and and did you like was that strictly kind of goon squad? You like you're coming there, you're supposed to fight. You know you're supposed to fight, and that's essentially what you're doing. Yeah, a little. I, no, not not really. I mean, we still tried to win games, but yeah, you knew you had to put on a show too, right? So it was. The first year was it was a little different. So yeah, we had fifteen, you know, heavyweights that that you couldn't all fight, right? So it was uh, right, but it was fun. I got suspended. the The commissioner suspended me after like eight games or nine games for the rest of that year because he just wanted to get rid of all the nonsense, right? So all the guys that came up just for home games or whatever, he suspended everyone, uh, me and about six other guys. Not and, for um, not for any like behavior necessarily. Just no, we had a line brawl, so we said everyone in the line brawl is is suspended for the rest of the season, uh, something like that, right? Oh, uh, okay. But it was funny because um, the playoffs come and Jimmy uh, pays me the same. I was making a thousand dollars a game, 
pays me a thousand dollars to come up for the weekend um just to sit behind the visiting bench and just to sit there <laughs> so i was sitting behind the visited bench the first uh you know the first year and uh in the playoffs and all the the adirondack players would be coming off and staring at me and like what the hell is this guy doing here <laughs> it's funny psychological warfare right right exactly that's crazy so would tell me a t-bone story because honestly that guy like jimmy i mean whatever i'm I, he obviously had the respect of like those those brothers like said you know like whatever he had an he had an aura about him and a presence and he was he was intimidating but that trainer man like he seemed like there was like a little bit of a screw loose like a little bit of craziness like, yeah. what, like yeah. what, what was the story with him He's, uh, he's so crazy. Um, I think he got suspended too that first year for the rest of the year. And then the second year he was, I think Jimmy just paid him to hang around. So we would hang around and he wasn't the trainer. I don't know what he did. He just hung around, but he was fun. That's crazy. Doing all that stuff to the opposing teams and not giving them towels and yeah. you know, all the rest of that crap. That's funny. Yeah. That's like slap shot type stuff. Yeah. So the second year I was the captain of the team the second year. Were you? Yeah. And, uh, that was a gong show too, right? So Jimmy would come in between periods and it, and I actually worked for the trash company too. So I was, you know, the here the first year people would get, their wives would get paid no show jobs and stuff like that. But um, I actually did work for the trash company because that was part of my uh, leaving the flyers is to make sure I had a job. Oh, okay. And um, so Jimmy would call me in his office. I'd be in, I was in sales and, uh, but part of sales was collecting the money from the sales, right? So if guys didn't pay for a couple months, I'd have to go see their business and come on and pay, right? Yeah. So Jimmy used to love telling people that I collected the money for him, right? Thinking that I was breaking legs and, and all that stuff, but I wasn't. It was just right stuff. <laughs> right. Um, so you actually did have a job because that's what they were saying. Like guys were working for three different things and like no show jobs. And was that that was just pretty much standard practice? Yeah, that was. But the second year, they, they tried to clean it up a little bit and try to do stuff more legit. I actually right. would work. Gotcha. How was that being like a player in that environment? Like, was it like, were you, were you guys rock stars in town or like how? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. We, um, we got treated first class, everything. Like imagine, like you said, you have seen the brothers, they got 10,000, you know, on the board for winning the game. Right. It's yeah. cash. So we'll go to the bar and tell me we were rock stars that night. Right. Right. And, and as far as like where you guys were, like they took care of your houses and stuff too. Yeah, all the minor league teams, they have to pay for housing, but we had some nice houses. So right. it, was, it was nice first class, like in, you know, double A hockey, you don't fly anywhere. You bus everywhere. But if we were going far enough away, we'd fly, which is unheard of. And right. we'd have all our meals catered. And it was first class for sure. That's pretty crazy. They, um, you mentioned like 15 tough guys or whatever, but you guys, I mean, you can't win hockey games just with tough guys. Like, I mean, it sounds like the chemistry was like, there was, what was yeah, I think the first year the chemistry was, and they backed off a little bit the second year, but still the first year people were scared to come to come play. Right. So a lot of people wouldn't show up because, you know, if you're going to take out the leading scorer and there's no one to back them up, like to protect them, then. Right. The leading scorer doesn't play. Doesn't play. Right. Right. Interesting. Um, how were you in that environment? Like, you I mean, were you one of the, like, were you, were you one of the big muscle? Like, were you the muscle on the team? Were you? Yeah, I was a little bit the first year. Um, like I said, there were so many that I fought a little bit, but maybe six, six times maybe. And yeah. then the second year I was just a normal year. I think, um, we had some toughness too, more than most teams, but it wasn't, um, over the top. Right. Yeah, I, it made me laugh in the uh, like this this high school kid that's given given the reins of this pro team, and he wants he wants it to be Mighty Ducks meets WWF. Right. <laughs> like what a wild, what a <laughs> wild circumstance that is to base your team around. But um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, from what the way they portrayed it, it sounded like you guys were successful. However, however it was, but yeah, um, we lost in the final that second year, but it was. Right, and then the next, the day after we lost is when they the FBI raided them, and so I had a two year contract, and um, I'm thinking I'm getting paid for another year, and then all of a sudden it's it stopped. Right, I was going to say, how did that affect the players? That whole thing, like, were you guys was anyone under investigation as far as the players were concerned? Yeah, I was, I think that they didn't question me at all because they knew I had a two year contract and for the company too, and so um, 
I didn't get paid, so I don't think they wanted that. I was trying to question them and saying, "Am I going to get this money?" And they wouldn't. They wouldn't take my questions. But right. uh, I think a couple guys did get questioned. Like I said, I think Todd Sterling got in trouble for it. Gotcha. Um, and I'm not sure who else did, but. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, I guess you don't know what's going on behind the scenes, really, right? I mean, and, right. And, and, with the assumption, like. That, that whole deal, like they didn't really get into that. Like, and first of all, maybe I, I'll show my naivety. Like they said, racketeering, he got charged for like, what does that even mean? Like what what, what was he doing that was- uh, yeah, uh, They said that, that he was inflating the prices on, on business trash hauling, like businesses. Um, he had every single business in the, you know, in 10 different counties. Um, and there wasn't a lot of competition. And I think he, he, um, he paid the mafia to make sure there wasn't competition, I guess, is what happened. But um, if you look at like what he did for the community, um, and, like he built a hospital wing, he built a football field for the town and just, he was more generous with his money than than he stole people's money, right? So it was, I think the feds just fucked him. Right. And, um, sorry, I shouldn't probably swear on you. Oh, well, I mean, yeah, your call. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't even know. I mean, I, I didn't get into that side of the story. It definitely seemed like there was some type of humanitarian element to him. I mean, I don't know him personally. Right. Um, but I didn't really get, I didn't really get like the mob ties. It wasn't like it sounded like he, there was a lot of, you know, like you said, you already mentioned legs being broken and stuff like that. But I guess he just monopolized his business, which is illegal. Right. right? So like I think it, they said he paid a, a mob tax to um, the Genovese crime family, um, $30,000 a month to make sure that, nobody else could compete with them in that right. area. And, and that was the horse like, that they kept mentioning. Yeah, yeah. Matty, I know the Matty the horse. Yeah. Paid the horse. That's yeah. so crazy. Wow. What a, what a, what a nut. Um, and to think that now you're, you know, that's a part of this, part of this Netflix lore. Um, mm -hmm. What was that section 102 like? Were they as crazy as they portrayed? Yeah. Yeah. They, uh, they didn't hold back when, uh, when they chanted and did stuff like that. You have good sections every town and every team you go to, but these guys were, we're ruthless and they still are i hope so i'm hoping them they'll come back this year uh, and support us like like before right. and i'm hoping jimmy comes back too so we'll see what happens he's still around i talk to him all the time oh dear and uh i'm hoping he gets involved again so so he's out of jail and that's all done yeah yeah he's out is he, is he operating anything he owns a gas and oil company now so he's not allowed to go back into the trash business but gotcha how big was that rink? I was looking at the fan. It didn't look like it really held that many, but did it? No, it didn't hold anything until he got until he bought the team. So it went from like seven hundred to I think he put in thirty five hundred seats or something. So it's thirty five hundred now. Oh, Not okay. Only, so still a relatively small rink for a pro yeah. rink, right? But I'm sure it got pretty wild and pretty uh, pretty loud in there. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Oh goodness. Um, and now you're back as the head coach. How did that? So who hired you, and uh, and who owns the team now? How did that whole thing work? It's um, yeah, it's a new group now. It's um, there's about six owners, but the two guys are uh, the main money guys are the Diamond Brothers, who own a ton of real estate and stuff around. Um, Colt Nor is involved. You know him? Yeah, I played yeah. against him. He was with the Toronto Maple Leaf, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's involved a little bit, and a couple other guys. Billy McCreary is involved, and and Herm Sorcher and a couple of the guys, but um, I, I coached there before in a, in a minor league there um, after the Trashers that wasn't as successful. The Our owner went bankrupt um, two months in and the team sort of held on for that year. And then it was, it was done. Right. So, that was the Mad know, Danbury Mad Hatters. Yeah, the Mad Hatters. Them. Right. Yeah. And then I, uh, so well, I, I that, so let me cut you off for a second. Cause like you were, you were 30 and 18, which, I mean, that's a 620 winning percentage. You guys never made the playoffs. I mean, how does that, how is yeah, that possible? Yeah, there, there was only four teams in the playoffs that, four teams in the league that year. They tried to hold the league together for, and there was a, it was just a bad, bad year. Gotcha. Our teams, our players didn't get paid and it was just bad. Oh, but, crazy. um, so I'm familiar with the, what works and what didn't work in Danbury. And so when they approached me this time around, um, I had a feeling it could work. Gotcha. And what league is that now? It's the federal, federal hockey league, federal prospects hockey league, FPHL. FPHL. Interesting. Uh, how long has that league been around for? I think it's been probably five or six years now. So it's, it's starting to become legit. There's, I think there was, there was nine teams this year, but a couple teams folded um, because of the COVID and all that. But um, 
I think there's seven teams now. Uh, we go out to Port Huron as the farthest west, and then we go down to Columbus, Georgia, would be the farthest south. Gotcha. Who are you get? Where are your players coming from? Like all over the place? Yeah, well, uh, not Europe this year. They banned that now. So um, just Canada and the U.S. and not as many. Can I think Canada is still a little bit closed, so we're trying to get visas and working that out there. So right. I'm trying to get some affiliations. Danny Breer is um, the head guy in Portland, the East Coast League. So I'm hoping he gives me a couple of players when they make their cuts and stuff like that. Oh, sweet. You know Danny too? Yeah, yeah. What a great guy. Yeah. Um, what uh... – just for those listening, like, what would a what would a job what what does a guy make there? Say is like whatever regular regular guy in, in that in that league, you know? Yeah, it's not it's, it's single tonight. A hockey. It's but here's the, yeah, so it's single A hockey. Um, most guys make about three hundred bucks a week, um, plus housing and all that. So, um, it's not a lot, but it's a step in in pro hockey. And uh, we're having a free agent camp on the twenty first of October to the twenty third. And if anyone wants to give it a shot up around Vernon area, come on down to the free agent camp. Gotcha. For all your listeners. Gotcha. Yeah, I know. So then, uh, so like you said, the housing is paid for. Like, a, is there any anything else like that would be regular expenses that are getting covered? Or are they covering? Yeah, well, they, you know, we get meals um, probably four or five times a week um, after practices and right. and stuff. And then you get the per diems on the road and all that. So. Right. Get to play some hockey. Yeah. Yeah, sounds good. You know, well, awesome, man. It was great to catch up. Good to see your face. Um, I'll be following the Dan Barry. Uh, are you guys going back to the Trashers? Is that what the name is? No, it's the Hattricks. Hattricks. Dan Barry gotcha. Hattricks. They're, yeah, um, I was going to tell you, too, that um, so my family in Canada is from uh, Inverness, Nova Scotia, um, yep. where they have that the best golf courses. I don't know if you're familiar with the the Cabot. Um, yeah, the Cabot, Cabot Link. Course. Yeah. So I have a house right there on right near the course. And I'm going to have an Airbnb pretty soon, that one. But I was also going to tell you that everyone in this town of Inverness um, works out in Fort McMurray. Oh, okay. And I remember I always told them that I my buddy owns a bar out there, I think. And that's you, right? You own, yeah. Do you still own that bar? Yeah, well, we, we just now don't, like, as of like a month ago. But, I mean, wow. since 1998 or 1999, we, we, we did. I got all my jerseys from, like – I just got them all back from the bar. I can't even believe it. it's almost like super nostalgic, but like I just went through it. They're all laying on the couch upstairs. So um, uh, should I used to tell my cousins of uh, Katie and Crystal and all them that they work out in Fort McMurray. I go to Pods and ask for Jason, uh, maybe you a drink or something. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. Yeah. I mean, the East, a lot of East coasters that uh, would come up there to Fort McMurray, a lot of Newfoundlanders too, right? Like right. it was, it was really good when I was going there a lot. I really enjoyed that. Cause it kind of connected me back to that region. And, uh, I just think the people from the East Coast are phenomenal. Like mm-hmm. they're they're good people. Um, easy to hang out with, easy to talk to, and um, and for some reason they seem to enjoy enjoy the pub. So uh, <laughs> it was all good. Um, yeah, well, I'll take you up on on that uh, on that place there. We'll have to go play the cat cabin. For sure, come on up. I'll, I'll hopefully be there all summer next summer. So we'll see. I love it. I love it. What a great excuse to come out. Um, yeah, man. Well, best of luck. Um, stay on here after 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 I sign off. We'll chat a little bit, but. Uh, awesome. Thanks for being a part of episode 71, man. All the best with uh, with the year this year and uh, r- ride the tidal wave here of this uh, of this Netflix release for as long as you can. I hope so. Thanks, both. Thanks for having me. All right, man. Cheers. All right. Thank you for tuning in today. If you haven't uh, already seen Untold Crime and Penalties, I suggest you do. I think it was about 90 minutes. Uh, whether you're a hockey fan or not, apparently you are a hockey fan because you're listening to me and you listen to the end. So thank you so much for doing that. Thanks for staying with us. Uh, but it's a pretty great story. And it's a story that I never knew about. Uh, I mean, I was overseas at the time playing. So I guess, um, you know, I, I'm entitled to not knowing. But, you know, considering that I did play with Dave McIsaac, he was my captain in Lowell. He was the captain of the Trashers. And for me not to know... Um, Dave Heimovich was another uh, teammate, old teammate of mine that was on that team. Uh, just I never knew anything about it. Uh, it is a wild, wild ride, a uh, really cool story, and, um, and something that I, I think is, is going to be a part of hockey lore um, forever, really, that team in the two years of their existence there, and, and obviously all the, all the surrounding uh, chaos and mayhem uh, that was a part of it. So uh, thank you for tuning in today, uh, and until next time, play hard. Keep your head up.